we've got a brand new database straight off the assembly line. It's pristine, it's clean. Uh, it won't stay that way for very long. To get a new database, a whole ecosystem of jobs will naturally just start to form around it. You've got to move data in, you've got to move data out, you have to futz with it in transit. And when you first start out as a DBA, you usually make a Python script. And then you end up making another one, and another one, and another one. Pretty soon you've got 50 of these scripts running around at all different times, doing all kinds of different things. And you built them at different times, so when you started out, and where you are now, you're probably a lot smarter. So you're, they're written in different ways. You'll get some that fail, and you need to go back and put in error trapping. And it gets to be a convoluted mess. And that's where an ETL tool comes in. ETL stands for Extract, Transform, and Load. Uh, it's basically a tool to help you move data around and futz with it in transit. Now, there's a product called Kettle, and it's an open source ETL tool, and it's fantastic. I've been using it for a long time. It, it's top notch, it's really great. And there is a spatial version of Kettle called GeoKettle. And it just had a new release, so I thought I'd take this chance to uh, do a quick demonstration of how Kettle works, how you might use it, and do a very basic Kettle 101 for spatial, for GeoKettle. And uh, we'll take a look at that, and I'll mention some of the other things you can do once you get into it. And it's not a complicated thing, but it will take some, some practice and trial and error to get everything right. But you'll be able to do it, because I could do it, and I'm not very smart. All right. We're starting out here with a directory with some shapefiles in it. And we've got a virtual, wake up, we've got a, just a virtual box instance of Ubuntu Server 11.04 with Postgres and PostGIS on it. That's really all it's running. So we're going to use GeoKettle to extract a shape file and load it. Maybe we'll even play with it a little bit in transit. I'll show you how that works. Now, I've downloaded GeoKettle from, uh, from the site as a zip file and just unzipped it. When you do that in Linux, you want to make sure all your uh, all the uh, shell scripts are executable. And then we'll just start Spoon. Now, in your Windows, you know, basically when you unload the zip file, if you're not using the new installer, You'll see spoon.sh for, for Linux and Mac and spoon.bat for Windows. And we are launching GeoKettle. I'm running it from a, thank you documentation. I'm running it from a command prompt. I'm using the, the new release, which is, the old release is version 3.2. The new release is version 2.0. A little confusing. It makes sense when they explain it. Um, but it's still a release candidate, so I'm kind of looking at looking for bugs when this runs. Now you can run GeoKettle, basically make a repository on a database server to store all your stuff. I usually don't do that, so I just hit no repository. And let's just start from scratch. This is how your interface will look when it opens. Now you've got two things you can do, a job or a transformation. Transformation takes data and basically transforms it and outputs it to something else. So each step in a transformation leads to the next step. It passes something to the next entry point. A job is essentially just a series of events that are only coupled in terms of that they're in a sequence. So you can run a series of transformations, you can run other stuff, and we'll take a look at that. Start out with a transformation. We're going to do Geo Transformation 101. We're going to take a shapefile input, let's drag it over onto the screen, double click, browse to our shapefile, uh, let's do voting precincts, and there you go. Let's do a preview and we'll just get, say, the first hundred records, so we're not 
waiting too long and you see it'll load a preview up in a table there's the geometry and it'll break it down into a very recognizable text format and there's a geographic view notice I limited it to a hundred records that way if you're loading a giant uh, database you, and you don't want to preview it and have it you know just sit there all day long you can do identifies on this and see the records now this is new in version 2.0 release candidate 1 of uh, geocattle so we got that let's I always like to set the SRS on whatever I'm loading just for funsies now to link up one step to the next you middle click on the previous step hold that down and then unclick on the next step and it'll link those two together and you can uh, flip it's, that's called a hop and you can change how that works now SRS we've only got one geometry field 2264 is North Carolina State Plain at 83 feet now we are going to add a sequence and that is because there are some open source tools like uh, for example QGIS that will not be happy if there is not a unique something on that table so let's make QGIS happy because it makes us happy so add sequence name of value name we'll call it GID so that's what the command line load tool does for post GIS start at one increment by one that's a good maximum value fine now we're going to output it go under output table output we're going to throw it straight into Postgres and post GIS table output new connection great thing about geokettle is you can connect to and do just about anything with anything so Postgres we'll just give a name Let's see 192.168.1.134 and where did I throw that stuff right there should never use a Postgres login for this kind of stuff I am a bad human being all right our connection target schema it'll default to public target table right now this uh, thing has absolutely nothing in it just geometry columns and spatial reference tables we're gonna go voting precincts now when if you are doing a transformation and the table doesn't exist yet you have to make it first so if you put in a table that isn't already there and go to the SQL it's going to tell you, you need to run this create table and you could mess around with this at this point or you could load it and then mess around with it on the Postgres side which is usually what I do we'll just leave it as it is say execute close did all my stuff for me two statements executed does the add geometry column automatically for you so now that table exists if we go back and look there it is waiting for our data and it's registered in the geometry columns table so we're going to want to truncate the table whenever this loads it's empty this first time but in the future it probably won't be now we don't need to specify database fields at this time this looks good so okay we'll save that and we'll just call it you know whatever save it as a KTR file now it saves these files as XML files essentially just a meta of of what this job is which is handy because if you needed to change a whole bunch of them for some reason or another you can probably script that out fairly easy fairly easily so got saved let's run it it's gonna ask you what kind of logging you want to do if you want to execute it on a remote server let's say launch and that's it it loaded 195 polygons like that if, and if you haven't had the joy of loading data into Postgres um, 
it's it's if you've done other spatial database administration it's it's a joy so it's there it is it's done we've got it loaded we can launch uh, QGIS if we want to yes it just launched that fast thank you solid state drive uh, yeah we'll connect to that server now another nice thing if you're not used to using post GIS when you connect to a database you could have 500 things in here it comes up that quick to this day, I'm not sure what SDE is doing when you go to connect to a database. I don't know what that hourglass is about, but this is really, really fast. And there's our voting precincts. Now, you'll want to mess with this a little bit later in, in a job. And the reason why... Uh, we're going to need a vacuum right now. You notice what's not on here is an index on your geometry column. You should always have an index on your geometry column. There it is. We just loaded data. Now let's do something a little fancier. Let's say we want to run this again, but we want to mess with the data a little bit on, on route. So this is a module that will let you do that in JavaScript double click let's say let's not get too f fancy here string uh, no is there a no yeah no so bar new field and we can make this new field anything we want we can write any kind of JavaScript we want here uh, just do it simple we'll say new field equals and these are other fields in that table prec no plus give it a space and concatenate with that the jud field judicial districts and test the script you'll see it sticks on the end this new field perfect so now when we do our table output we're going to go to specify database fields enter field mapping guess you see this new field didn't have a match what we're going to do is we're going to take the judicial field instead of ma making that equal to the other judicial field we'll have it calculated from the new field this is really handy when you load shape files because the universal rule of shape files is you'll never get the same data schema twice so you can fix that you can remap things to other things and you can do things like change value types from integer to string and string to integer and screw around with bad date fields and all kinds of stuff. So there we go. We're all mapped out. It's going to truncate the old records and map those fields in. See, judicial now will now be a number and a space and a letter when we're done. And we'll save that, run it. Up it goes. Just that fast and we're done. We'll go back and do, do, see there's a number and a space where that judicial field used to just be a B. Now it's 212, the prec no, plus a space, plus the judicial field value. Notice too that when we truncated and add that stuff, we didn't get any, any, uh, your table is currently locked by some bozo message. Thank you again, PostgreSQL, PostGIS, you're awesome. Okay, that is a transformation. Now let's take a look at a job. And a job is just a series of steps. We'll give it a starting point. We'll call our transformation. We'll point it to uh, that particular transformation we just did. If I can remember where it is. There we go. And there's all kinds of million little parameters here you can set. That job is just going to start and run that transformation. Not very helpful. But what you could also do as part of this is all kinds of stuff. Like if this job goes bad, it goes south on you. You could have it 
send you an email. See, this green line indicates go here if things went well. Change that evaluation to when things uh, screw the pooch. It will send send you an email. You can put in all your email server parameters and all that stuff. It will give you all the error messages and, and basically run for your life, whatever you want to tell you. You can, let's say this is a, a mission critical sort of thing and we can't have the sucker blowing up. We can check to make sure the file exists before we start running that transformation. We can check to make sure certain columns exist in that file. We can, um, there, there's all kinds of other conditional evaluations. Maybe that file's on a different server. Maybe it's on an FTP server. You could transfer that file here with FTP before any of this starts. And when you're done, you could put that file on an FTP server somewhere else. So a job is where you wire everything together. And to, you, to execute these on a script, they have a shell script or a batch file in your zip folder that's called pan, which will be for transformations, and kitchen, which is for jobs. And you can schedule these things up. You can have it logged to a file with different logging levels. Really slick. And that's it in a nutshell. You can see there's a million different things you can do with Kettle and GeoKettle. Uh, I've been using it a long time and I probably have only used a tenth of what you can do with it. That's GeoKettle in a nutshell, a, a very tiny nutshell because those are very simple examples that really didn't scratch the surface of what it can do. I've been using it at work for a long time and I've barely scratched the surface of what it can do. It's a very powerful ETL tool. Uh, I've been using it for a long time for mission critical data operations I mean, a lot of different kinds of servers, uh, RD BMSs like Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres, MySQL, to text files, to access databases, to DBF files, and FTPing stuff from servers, and it's never let me down. So it's an extremely powerful tool. They've had a lot of great new features to it. So if you do ETL work, I highly recommend you check it out. Now, on a technical note, uh, just about the podcast, I got a new microphone. It's a blue USB snowball. Hopefully, I will sound a little bit less like that robotic voice you hear from the emergency broadcasting system. I was using the microphone on my Logitech webcam. Uh, I'm still going to use that webcam for video, even though it's low. It's not high definition. There are things in life you need to see in... 1080p high definition, not really one of them. Emergency broadcasting system, folks, come here. You don't need to interrupt my television show to let me know a thunderstorm is coming. I'll give you three good reasons. Uh, one, here in the south, the weather forecast between June and say September, every single day is hot, humid, chance of thunderstorms. We already know they're coming. Two, when I get this warning, I'm in front of my television, in my house. I'm already where I'm supposed to be. Three, it's not like these things just sneak up on you. You can hear a thunderstorm coming. You can see it coming. If you have a good nose, you can smell it coming. My wife has a peg leg. She could, it's not exactly a peg leg. She has a broken bone in her foot but she can feel a thunderstorm coming. So these things are not sneaking up on you such that we would need a warning. So, thunderstorm warnings, I don't need to know that shit. You know what I need to know about emergency broadcasting system? Zombies. <laughs>